uh, GMM estimator or, or S2 app to highlight what a moment function is so question one so again for question one what uh, it, what I'm talking about relates to question one we would not need to go into all this detail I'm going I'm going to go into a lot of detail to again reiterate the idea of a moment function so assume that we believe that the distribution of y and x is linear in parameter like this with some disturbance term where e of these are then a set of assumptions and we can then see which which assumptions are consistent with this um, which models are consistent with this assumption and we know we can solve this and find that B naught is the expected value of xi xi dash minus one e xi yi. That's if this e xi matrix is full rank. Then there's a unique solution. So we've already seen this. We can then solve the sample version of this to n of the residual minus a candidate model beta times xi again remember this is the first order condition for OLS to not and we can solve this and find beta hat is just going to be the sample version of this i equals 1 to n xi again assuming that there's no linearly redundant combinations of regresses x so that this sigma that this matrix is full rank and again the one over n's cancel out but again you can, you can keep the one over n's here they'll cancel out but we can see then we can get the solution to the sample version this here is just the restriction which hold the population level which gives us b naught or the parameter which solves this and we then solve the sample equivalent and get this method of moments estimator Okay, so then, and we've already seen we can study the properties of this. If y and x are iid, then one over n sigma i equals one to n x i y i tends in probability to its expectation, the population expectation, and likewise one over n. Again, assuming IID, you can show it under weaker conditions, but assume just for simplicity that Y and X are a random sample IID, then we can do a weak law of large numbers, and as the sample gets bigger, the sample averages converge to their population average. XI, XI, dash. And again, because this is full rank, its inverse exists, so by the continuous mapping theorem, the inverse of this what's going on converges to the inverse because it's assumed to be full rank well these two things just established then by Slutsky's theorem that this, the sample OLS estimator, converges in probability to the true value. But we can see, we can, we can view all these properties not by looking at the solutions to the moment and the sample moment, but by looking at the properties of the equations that they solve. Namely, the OLS estimator solves this equation and we are assuming the true parameter solves this population equation. So we can again, so the, in this case, the moment function for OLS, call it G, uh, G of Y, so let's call it G well, it's just going to be this part here, this is our moment function, this is the bit, we've got XI times the residual for a given beta and we want to choose the beta to be uncorrelated with this residual with x 
This is our moment function. Then, so for question oh, for, for question one, so we've got our moment function. Well, the GM in this particular, then we got we could take the average of this, get the sample average, call it for shorthand g hat beta, just is the average, just define it again. This is a shorthand notation for the average moment function. Well, we want to solve, set the average of this function again. Remember, this is what we solve to get the OLS estimator. It's the sample version of the population condition. It's also remember the first order condition from two from OLS when we minimise the sum of square individual. We then want to solve. We can see then call this g hat beta. We know then that g hat beta equals not will be solved at beta hat OLS. Just solving this, and the solution is going to be this here. But we're just keeping it now just implicitly defined. So in other words, g hat b hat OLS solves the the moment function. In this case then, we've got as many equations, moment functions as we've got unknowns, and we can exactly solve it. So in this particular case, this is then the GMM estimator. Because there is it's the method of moment to the special case of the generalized method of moments. And we can see when we've got as many equations as we've got unknowns, then it doesn't matter how we weight the moments when we come to do GMM, it will always have the exact solution somewhere or not. So it doesn't matter how we weight the the moment functions. So this is the GMM this is the GMM estimator here. But so then what is the GMM estimator? How is it linked to this? And so again we talked about then in some instances we've got more moments and we've got parameters. For example, let's say we've got one endogenous variable and hence one parameter and we've got five instruments or ten or whatever else then we've got more equation with which to solve for the true parameter then we've got parameters to estimate for in that case we can't solve ten equations in general for one parameter so but each individual moment function is giving you some information about what the true parameter is because each one of them has got to be near to naught if to be consistent with the, the moment function so let's take another example then, which relates to then question two. I think two was the one on two stately square. So let's give an example of a moment function where we've got more moments than parameters, and then talk about GMM, and then finish off the questions. So we've just given an example of the method of moments. So we just saw how we can write our estimator as a solution to some moment condition, a sample moment condition. So it's not as interesting here because this is exactly solvable. We can set this exactly to naught and then solve. And in this particular case, we can actually solve it. We can solve it um, and get a closed form solution. But that's not always the case. Sometimes our moment, our estimator will be implicitly defined. It'll be a nonlinear function and we won't be able to solve. Or sometimes we've got more equations than we've got unknowns. So we can't set all of them, ex all of the moment functions exactly to naught. So for example, Suppose we've got a one a scalar model with just one regressor EI. I've got any questions on the We've got a scalar model plus EI got a scalar one regressor and, and hence one parameter and suppose that zi includes two regressors two instruments z1i and z2i and we're assuming that these are exogenous so that e this here equals not this gives us then two equations with which to solve for beta not and we can't solve both at once in the sample case so then he's in this case then we've got two equations with which b to not solve so we've got two equations to use this then is the moment function we can take then sorry the moment condition 
we can then take our moment function, call it gyxzi equals, we've got the residual then again xi is a scalar, just one parameter times both of our instruments. Or we've only just rewritten this, so we've, we have that the expectation of g, y, i, x, i, beta here equals naught at the true parameter. That's what this is saying here, because remember e, i is just this residual at beta naught. And we're saying that at beta naught, e, i and both the instruments are statistically orthogonal on average. We've then got a moment condition which defines B0, but now we've got two equations and one parameter. We can then try and solve the sample version. One, we could then take the sample moment, the average, G, Y, I, X, I, beta. This is just the sample estimate of the moment function for any beta. And we know then as N gets bigger, the sample average of the moment will be quite near in probability to the population average. So the a lot of these elements should be near to naught, but they can't necessarily in all cases solve them all to be naught because we've got more equations than unknown. And in most cases you will not get the knife edge case where we can solve and get one and get a um, solution. In general there'll be no solution to, to this to get to set all of them to naught. Here you're going to get two equations. We can set one to naught and choose beta, but in general that will not set the other equation to naught, in general. So then, but we know that the nearer these are to naught, in broadly speaking, then on average the closer that the, the beta that sets this near to naught will be to the true parameter. So this beta that solves this um, population moment function. So the idea of GMM then, to call this G hat beta, in that case when we can't set all of these equations to naught because we've got more equations than unknowns, is then to make a measure of distance from naught. So pick some g hat beta dot some weight matrix. Again, it's going to be um, a square matrix with, in general, when we've got m, when we've got m moment um, function, this will be 1 by m. This will be m by 1 g hat beta. This is m by 1. So we've got m moments and we take some usually we'll pick some symmetric positive definite weight matrix usually full rank as well this then in general is, is always bigger than naught some quadratic forms so it's going to be bigger than naught for all beta at least it's greater great or equal to naught and it will measure, it'll give us a scale, it'll give us a, a this, is, this weight matrix is called a norm, and it will give us a measure of how far away for any beta this g hat beta is from naught. Call this the objective function q hat beta. This then here is the GMM objective function for a given weight matrix W, and this WN is selected by the researcher. So, and there's, so there's no unique distance from naught. So, the weights of how you measure it could vary. So think of a vector, and we want to measure how far away it is from not. Suppose we're at say two. We've got x one and x two. This should be kind of say g one and g two. Think of it right. Think of it for. Think of looking at this g hat two, and g um, one. Suppose this is two one, for a given value of beta. Then how far? How do we then measure how far away this is from not? Well, it depends how much we give weight to deviations in this direction, and in this direction. So every different weight matrix in general is going to give a different measure of distance, but they're still going to measure how far we are we are away from not. And as n gets bigger, as the sample gets bigger, these moment functions will get closer and closer to the true parameter, and this weight will get this this weighting average will get nearer and nearer and nearer to not at the true. Um, parameter and it will deviate so away from not if it's identified if namely if this if if if, if a beta away from b not this doesn't equal not well this will converge to something that's not equal to not at beta away from b not but that's the idea is we're going to choose some weight matrix and we'll choose this weight to have up to we'd like to choose this weight to have some optimality properties namely we want to give more weight 
to those moment functions that are revealing the most information about the true parameter. So broadly speaking, to give more weight to those moment functions that have got a smaller variance because they're going to be nearer to the population expectation and that's solved at B0. So the less noisy the moment, the more information it's going to give about the true beta naught. And that's why how we choose this weight. We like to choose this weight matrix to have optimality properties. But this is the general defin definition of GMM. You've got some moment function as a function of your data, call it WI and beta. This is an M by one known function. We're given two examples now. This is a P by one vector of coefficients. We assume that this moment function is solved at some beta equals B naught, and we're going to assume it's unique for now. Well, everything you're going to assume is that's a unique solution that it's um, globally identified, namely at values other than B naught, it will not equal naught. We then construct our sample moment as an estimate of the population moment. So it's going to be a little bit off. It won't be exactly there. It's going to be a noisy estimate of this. Again, in general, if m equals p, it's just identified. We can set this exactly to naught and solve. If m e greater than p, then we're going to have to wait. So we could either just drop a number of the moment functions out. So we've got as many moments as parameters and solve. That case, it's just identified. So we're going to have p, in this case, when m is bigger than p, we're going to have m minus p, what are called over-identifying restrictions. Namely, we could drop m minus p moments, and then it would be just identified, and then we could solve this moment function. But in general, that won't be efficient, because these m minus p moment functions that we drop are telling you something about b to naught, because all of these remaining m minus p moment functions will be solved as a sample gets bigger at or near the true beta naught. So we don't want in general to drop them out. So we want to use these remaining other identifying restrictions in some optimal way. GMM, again, so do, pick some, call G, Q hat beta W, pick some weight matrix, WN, where we just assume that WN, it could be a random matrix, converges to some fixed bounded limit, which is going to be positive definite and symmetric. And usually we'll pick it to be full rank. Then the GMM estimator in general is just defined as the parameter which minimizes across beta this objective function for a given weight matrix. So that is that this is the general definition of the GMM estimator. It's some call time the first step GMM estimator because sometimes we first get a consistent estimate of we first get an estimate of the true B naught and then we try and we then try and estimate the optimal weight matrix to then do a second round where we can get a more efficient estimate of the true parameter. But this is the key idea that it's called generalized method of moments because it generalizes a standard method of moments which has as many moments as parameters to allow more mo mo moments than parameters and we weight them in some way. So then we can then now see how we've all, we've all, and so we can now see then that OLS is an example of a GMM estimator. So let's do question one again more formally now. So we've got a yi equals xi dash b naught plus ei expectation. This is the assumed model we want to put a restriction on. We then take the sample version of this as our moment function xi yi minus xi dash b. So this is our g hat beta here. So we can actually see straight away, in this case, when we've got as many parameters b as we've got equations given by the x, in this case, it's just identified. So we can see, actually, we've already done here because it doesn't matter what the weight matrix is, 
and when it's just identified, we can always set this exactly equal to naught. And therefore, it doesn't matter how we set the weight matrix. The minimum of the minimum value this function can take is naught, because it's always greater than or equal to naught, because it says it's a quadratic form with a symmetric positive definite weight matrix. So it's always greater than or equal to naught. It can't be less than naught. So the minimum is attained at naught. So once you can set this equal to naught exactly, then that's it. That is the GMM estimator. But another way you can write it is, well, this here is, you can stack this in its matrix at vector form. It's x dash y minus x b. So we can stack this up and put them all out. This When we expand it all out, this will give us a sum form here. So then the GMM objective function, g hat beta dash omega weight matrix g hat beta is just equal to y minus x beta dash x w n x dash y minus x b. I want to minimize this. So you can you can just differentiate this. You can find the first order condition by differentiating with respect to beta and setting it equal to naught and you'll find beta hat equals x dash well for, for you, you can you can go that route and work it all through but Really, it's irrelevant because you can see straight away we want to find the minimizer of this, but we know that b hat equals x dash x minus 1 x dash y. We'll set this exactly equal to naught, and therefore that's its minimum because g hat b dash wn, the weight, weighted average, is always at least as big as naught. So the minimum as occurs at naught. So this is the solution to the GMM problem. So you can just leave it there, or you can go the, the route of the notes, the solutions, which is to actually solve the first order condition, and you'll get this in general. And in our case, z is equal to x. But this here is what we get when we do uh, instrumental variables. In our case, the z is equal to x. So it's going to simplify down. <clears throat> okay, and we can just choose the weight matrix to be the identity matrix because it's not going to depend on the weight matrix anyway. So you can go that route, but I think more intuitive is just to see that actually it doesn't matter what the weight matrix is, we, we can take the first order condition and work it through, but remember, we know the minimum occurs when this function equals naught because that's the minimum value it can take. And this part will be exactly not at this beta hat. So this this implies that this is the minimizer. So this here then is the parameter which minimizes this GMM objective function, no matter what the weight matrix is, so long as it's symmetric and positive definite. Okay. So then the I this what this establishes is is that OLS is an example of a GMM estimator. A GMM estimator in general is the parameter that minimizes this objective function for some weight matrix. No matter what the weight matrix is, so long as it's symmetric, positive, definite, the minimizer will always be beta hat. And we can solve for that. Because you can set this exactly equal to naught. The next one is then that the two-stage least squares estimator is a special case of efficient GMM when the errors are heteroscedastic. So this here is the two-stage least squares estimator. We'll talk about where that comes from in X because that's question three. It probably should have come first. But just take that as is. That's a formula for the GMM, for the two state least squares estimator, where this is a projection matrix in Z. And we're told, well, the efficient weight matrix for a GMM is the inverse of the variance of the moment. And we're assuming that the errors are homoscedastic, which means that this formula, sigma, simplifies down to this. What this is saying is, this relates to what's called two-step efficient GMM, where we want to choose the weight matrix optimally. And it turns out, when we've got the moment function, we've got G of our data set, B. This is our moment function, and we're saying it's uniquely solved at some parameter, call it B naught. 
We can also then work out what's the variance of this moment function, variance of g, w, i, b, at the true parameter. Well, this is not at the true parameter, so it's just going to equal the expected outer product, because the mean of it is not. This here is the variance of this moment function at the true parameter. And in the in the two stately squares case, well, the moment function, in that case, wy, our data, is going to be yi, xi, zi. Well, this is just the z times by the residual. Again, we've already seen this. This is a moment function from our instruments. So we can plug this into here and at B0, so we evaluate it at B0. Well, at B0, this is just the residual, so we're going to get ZI, EI. So we can plug this into here and work out what's the variance of the, the two state least squares moment function. So this is an M by 1 moment and this is a P by 1 vector of parameters. So we've got our moment function. We then want to call this sigma. So what we're, what we're getting at here is that in general, the weight matrix, which will give you the efficient estimator, is the inverse of this. So if we, if we can go back to our GMM estimator, and if we knew what this was, this inverse of the variance of the moment at the true parameter, we can use that if it, as our weight matrix. And it turns out the minimizer of this will be efficient. So call this Q hat omega minus 1b. This here is a GMM objective function with weight matrix equal to the inverse of the variance of the moment. We're not going to prove this. It's kind of it's similar to how we proved that um, that OLS is best linear unbiased when we have um, a homoscedastic and serial uncollated errors. It's a similar idea. We can prove that if we use weight matrix under these... Um, under the assumption that the moment restriction holds a unique parameter and some technicality conditions, we can show that the minimizer of this will be efficient. It will have the lowest variance amongst other GMM estimators. Okay, so we're not going to go into the into the full um, proof of this, but that's the result. But we don't know what this omega is, this variance of the moment at the true parameter. So the idea is, is to estimate this. You, first, you do a first step and you estimate beta and then you can estimate then the average of this. So you can estimate this, um, this optimal weight matrix. So that's the idea, is that this here turns out to be the, the inverse of this variance is the optimal weight matrix. It will, what it does is it weights these moments in such a way to give more weight to those moments that are giving you the most information about beta the ones with the smallest um, variance, which is what we want. Because the smaller the variance of some elements of the moment function, well, the nearer they are to the population expectation. And the population expectation is uniquely solved at B0. And we want that. We want, we want the estimator to get as near as possible to that. If some of the elements of G hat beta are really noisy, well, they can be, even at the true parameter, they can be really far away from not because they're very variable. So therefore they're less reliable when we solve these equations or we give more weight to those equations in our in our in our weight in our loss think of it as a loss function, then this is going to pull us away from the true beta naught. So that's the idea. We then need to estimate this. Well we but, but first of all we can see well what is the form of this in our example. So assume that we're assuming that the the ZI and the YIs and so on are all IID. So we can plug this in and we'll get in our case is equal to expectation of we're going to get EI squared ZI ZI dash so again assuming that the Y X and Z are all IID then we get um, this sorry not that what's that they're independent sorry so assume that the Y and the Z are independent so we don't have we don't get all of the in, in the more general case we'd also get all of the covariances of EI in different time periods where we're assuming all these are not and that they're independent of this Z. Then this would be our optimal weight matrix. But we don't know what this is because we can't measure EI. But if we assume that the errors are um homoscedastic, so that this equals not 
Well, this implies by the by the by the um, if we assume sorry, it's constant for all i. So this is that the errors are homoscedastic. Well, in that case, the optimal weight matrix simplifies down because by the law of iterate expectations, we're going to get e z e of this given z. by L I E. When we condition on Z, Z's fixed, so it comes outside. So we're gonna get E of Z Z I Z I dash times E E I squared given Z I. And we're assuming that these are all constant for all I and Z. This becomes sigma squared. So it's just sigma squared E Z Z I Z dash. So assuming independence this here is the general variance of the moment function in t for two stately squares. And if the errors are heteroscedastic from our regression, it simplifies down further to this. So it's much easier to estimate this because we can estimate this by using the sum of squares residual from the, reg from the um, regression. And we can estimate this just by z dash z. So then, in, our, in this case, the optimal weight matrix is the inverse of this. And this is a lot easier to estimate. So, the next step then, how do we estimate this? Well, sigma, we can use this estimate. We can take the estimate of sigma squared using the sum of squared residuals and then z dash z over n. And remember, z dash z over n is just 1 over n sigma i equals 1 to n z i z i dash and again assuming independence and some weak conditions we're going to get e z i well independence we'll do here z i dash and that it's bounded and exists and again under with some weak conditions we can show sigma hat squared converge in probability to sigma squared so this will converge in probability to the efficient weight matrix so again assuming that we've not got any linearly redundant combination of instruments which we can remove if we have them we can then show that the inverse of this will converge to the inverse of this by the continuous mapping theorem because the inverse is continuous but of course it requires that this inverse exists so we can then use this inverse of this as the optimal weight matrix that's what this question is getting at is that when it when the errors are when the errors are homoscedastic this is the optimal estimated weight matrix so we perform GMM with this. So we use this weight matrix. We get G hat dash B. We get our objective function, lambda hat minus one, G hat B. Well, we plug this in to here and we solve. So that's what the solution gives. And that's what it's getting at. When the errors are heterohomoscedastic, it means that we can simplify down estimating this optimal weight matrix. And we can differentiate that respect to beta and find the first order condition. And you can see from the so you can run through that. It work it's run through it in the lectures. We can get the general formula, which is this. We're going to show it's equal to this, but this will be the solution. So this here is just the omega hat sigma hat minus one, and the sigma hat minus one. So this is the solution when we minimum when we go back to here. So if we stack it all up together, in our case. Remember, our moment function is this. So we're going to get g hat beta is z dash y minus x b. This stacks all the moment function. When we expand all this out, we're going to get which is our average moment function. So we can work this. So plugging this all together, we're going to get as the optimal estimated weight matrix in this example is y minus xb dash z. And then we've got a sigma hat minus 1, z dash y minus xb. And if you differentiate this with respect to beta and use simple vector calculus, which you should have covered earlier then, you can find the solution to this. This is just a quadratic form, it's similar to, well, in the scalar case, it's similar to minimizing a quadratic in beta, but it's for the vector version. So then, 
this is the objective function for the general for a general number of moments m for p parameters when we estimate the optimal weight matrix assuming that the errors are homoscedastic so we can take this as an estimate which will converge in probability to the true optimal weight matrix which we can't observe and the minimizer of this we can show is in here where this again this we call it sigma hat squared but this is just a, this we this is called it s squared this is, this is the sigma hat squared the estimate of sigma squared so we can then simplify it all down well this s squared over n is going to cancel out because we're going to invert it here so then we're going to invert and invert so it's going to come out so we're going to invert and then invert again so we're going to get back to itself multiplied by the inverse of this so this this part the one over ns squared will cancel out when we invert it all out and we get down to here well this is just pz and this is just pz which this here is just the definition of the so the, it's a little bit that they should this should call this it's a bit confusing call this b hat gmm that's the solution to this minimization we had here and we can see that this is equal to beta hat two stage least squared okay so there's a little bit of algebra there but that, that's what's going on so you work through that you'll have seen you've done the you've done the um vector calculus before when you find the when you get the general solution to the um, OLS estimator for minimizing the sum of squared residuals the next bit then is to explain why the estimator is two stage can you show exactly how it can be computed in two stages well so you first regress the variables x on the instruments z so what this does it stacks all the x's into x which is n by k equals well if you stack them all together you're going to get z which is n by m each row of this is the the we've got n data point and for each data point each row is going to include the instrument for that data point for all m instruments times pi which is an m by k vector matrix of coefficients how z relates to x so each um each row of this then so you're going to get you're going to get the row going down and then each sorry each column will then refer to the pi for that particular x so you're going to get kx's in here for each n there's kx variables and each one of them has got a separate sub regression where we regress z on pi and this pi constacts all these um, effects of z on the different x1 to xk's together so we've got k we've got k regressors here in x and we've got m instruments plus v so we can always write it like this what this means here is you first run this regression you get the OLS estimate which again as always is z dash z minus 1 z dash x that's the OLS estimate we then want the fitted value which is this z times pi hat which gives us this so remember the idea of two stage least squares you first regress x on all the instruments you take the fitted value from that regression to get the overlapping variation of x and z which is given by this plug it in well this here is just the projection matrix so this is our fitted value and the, it makes sense this pz is a projection matrix it projects the columns of x onto z it finds the overlapping variation of these two um, variables x and z the second stage of the regression then is to regress y on this and the formula for that well call this x hat well two daily squares regress to, to regress y on x on x hat well this is the usual formula x hat dash x hat minus one x hat dash y and that's what this is saying here then you plug in x hat the next line then is using a couple of results here. When we expand this out here, you'll get so this is missed a couple of steps here. This when we expand this out, you'll get x dash pz dash p 
pzx and the reason this again is just pz here the reason why it simplifies is that remember this pz is idempotent that means that it's symmetric so that this holds so we're going to get x dash pz pzx and it's also satisfies this so it's idempotent so the square of this equals itself which equals x dash pzx so it simplifies down and that's what it is so this is why the two stately squares estimator has this form this is the general formula for the two stately squares estimator okay and we can see implicit in this this here has got to be invertible so we've got to have at least as many instruments as we've got regressors otherwise you can't do it you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to invert this so that's why this is in the form for this. the instrumental variable estimator defined as this well the instrumental variables estimator is the case when m equals p well in that case then you can see you can see you can see straight away because the iv is a special case of the two stately squares and the two stately squares is a method of moments um, a, gen, a, a GMM estimator so we can see here when Z equals P well we can just use that in here this is the formula in general when M is greater than or equal to P well that formula will collapse down to this when M equals um, P another way to see it is that when you've got as many instruments as you've got parameters the moment function this we've got M you've got because M equals P you've got P instruments and p parameters so you can actually solve this equal to not exactly at the iv estimator b hat equals z dash x minus one z dash y you can actually solve this exact well this just says we can set g hat beta equal to not exactly then and that's it so then so then this is the minimum of the this would be the minimum then this B hat is the minimum of this moment of the GMM estimator for any weight matrix because we can set the sample moment exactly equal to naught, and the minimum of the GMM the minimum of the GMM objective function is naught. So any weight matrix that's positive, definite, and symmetric will always have the minimum at here because we can set the moment to naught for any weight matrix. Another way to see this is just to take this moment function and again take the GMM estimator again for a given weight matrix. And we can simplify it all down. So then you can take the inverse to the next line here. So this is used the result that a b c minus one is equal to c to the minus one, b to the minus one, a to the minus one, assuming they're all square here and the same dimension. And it works it through. So these two cancel out, then these two cancel out, and then we're back down to IV. So what the and this and you can see this is for any weight matrix, so long as it's invertible, then so as long as it's full rank, any weight matrix have the same minimum. We'll have the same minimizer. This beta hat GMM is this here is a minimizer for a given um, weight matrix WN, where this is the moment function, and we can see we can set the moment function exactly to naught. So you could all, you could also explain it that way as well. And it also makes sense because IV is a special case of two stately squares where M equals P. The number of moments is equal number of regret instruments is equal to the number of parameters. So two stately squares is GMM, as we've seen, and IV is a special case of that, so that's also GMM as well. Okay? So prove that the IV estimator is equivalent to indirectly squares. So I think you've seen this in the lectures. So what's going on here? So where what where does it we've already seen this from before here. So let's let's see where this comes from. Well this is a definition of it, and what we can show is if you plug these in, so this here is the Psi hat, and you can see that this is the regression formula of x on z, and this lambda hat is the regression of z on y. So this indirectly squares. So what's going on here then? Well, let's say you've got a regression of y on x. Stack them all together, so you have this. Again, this is in its general for n by 1, n by k, k by 1, n by 1. Also stack all of the x's, 
So you're going to have n by k. And in this case, then, you're going to have the z, which is n, which we've already seen this, times the pi, all the coefficients for all of the k regressors, which is n by k, plus v, which is all the disturbances. So if you plug this into here, you'll find y equals, you're going to get z pi beta plus, and then you'll get then v of beta plus u, this new error term here. This just says you can, the coefficient, well, we can regress y on z. So call the regression of y on z, so call this, this lambda. So we can see if we regress y on z, what it, e, what it estimates plus some new error term. Again, v is exogenous by definition of pi, so v and z are uncorrelated. And we're assuming that u and z are uncorrelated as well. So that both of these are uncorrelated with z. So we can run a regression here, and we can see that what this is going to identify is this lambda. And that's it. So the idea of two stately squares then, well, we can estimate pi from this first regression. So the idea is, is that lambda, the thing that we can get from regressing, estimate from regressing y on z, is equal to pi, which is the regression coefficient from z x on z times the thing of interest. So assuming that pi is full rank, that it's identified, we can then get the Well in this instance you've got to assume it's not actually stated here, but the question should say when it's m equals p. So we've got to have that this this here in, in general is, sorry, when m equals, yeah, okay, we'll call it k, we'll call it k here, I think, the number of regressors. Well, you can see that because this will be m by k. So in order to solve for this, we have to have m equals k so it's square and that it's full rank. If that's the case, then beta is the inverse of this times beta. Okay, I think, well, they've called it this side, so you could write it like that. It's the same thing, so they've written it this way. So you see the question you had to state really, that you had to have that this, it's got to be, you, you can generalize this up, but in this particular case, when they've got the indirectly squares, this form, it's got to be that this inverse exists. So you have to have that this inverse exists, so it's got to be square. For example, if it was two by one, you can't invert that matrix. It's got to be a square matrix. So as long as this is full rank, this gamma, and it's invertible, then you can solve for, for beta is done at times, sorry, times lambda. So then you could just replace these with their sample estimates. So the indirectly squares estimates this from regressing x on z. Well, that's just this coefficient here, here, multiplied by the regression. Well, this lambda is from the regression of y on z. So we can estimate that from regressing y on z, and that's this here. So this here is the definition of indirect. So again, this is again if bad. This is indirectly squares in the case when we've got as many instruments as we've got um, parameters, and that this is invertible. So it's so it's identified. So that's what's going on with ide with ide So you can see he's doing the he's doing the same thing as two stately squares. He's just broken it down in a different way. He's doing the exact same thing. We're regressing one on. You're regressing, it's to say this is the same thing as regressing x on the instrument, taking the fitted value, and then regressing y on that. But again, it relies on m equals k. So it's got to be just identified for this result. So finally, then, the feasible generalized least squares estimate.